Uh, thank you, everybody. I'm very happy and excited to be here. So my name is Jack I'm from Sci-Fi. Um, so Sci-Fi was founded by the uh, inventors of RISC-V. Um, and I just want to take a step back uh, for everybody to realize how far we've all come. Because really, I, what I'm going to talk about today is the markets and areas that I think RISC-V will start to see success and where RISC-V will be deployed and how we're going to have commercial deployments uh, that it's really going to grow this ecosystem. Uh, but it's really, really important to realize this is very early in the development of RISC-V. And just, you know, at an event today, you know, yesterday and today, I think we have like 250 people here. And if you go back to where we were with some of the RISC-V events when we just started, when, when sci fi just started three years ago, we had, you know, 40 people, 30 people uh, at the first one. Um, so really I see this year, 2019, as the year where a lot of the RISC-V work is going to show up. So not just people in this room or people who've been following RISC-V, but all the engineers in our industry, uh, the people at these tech companies are all going to know what RISC-V is and they're going to start to see actual products all come out. So when people ask me, you know, what, what is the state of RISC-V adoption? And how many people are using RISC-V? You know, am I early, am I late? And I tell people that if, if you don't start now, you're already late. It's like an iceberg. There's so much activity going on. And I think everybody here, you know, we're all, we're all in this ecosystem. We're all growing the ecosystem. You know, at the same time, we're all competing. We all have different customers that we're working on that I'm sure uh, everybody has that other people don't know. So I'm really excited to see uh, what will happen uh, as these things become uh, deployed over the year. Um, and just to kind of give, uh, you know, a retrospective of how far we've, we've moved, because uh, this is towards a, you know, one of the last talks of the day. Um, Rick over there, he said I was going to call out, um, he's been here since, since the, the very beginning when the amount of risk five, you know, people who showed up uh, didn't even fill up like a third of this room. And that was like everybody in the risk five ecosystem. All right, and I think we should recognize Rick because this is actually uh, his last official event uh, as, as uh, executive director of the risk five foundation. Um, so he's grown a lot. So. All right, so where do I think RISC-V is going to see success first? Now, obviously, RISC-V as an ISA is developed to support all types of compute, right? The instruction set is there. It's a very strong base, but we need lots of different implementations of RISC-V. RISC-V means that everybody will be able to have their own CPU. Everybody will have their own custom hardware for exactly their applications. So which applications can use this first? Well, it's what I call embedded intelligence. So what is embedded intelligence? So traditionally, all of these embedded devices, these are things that touch the real world. So things that touch, uh, if you're talking about Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or IoT or things in storage, that you're touching a physical medium. You're touching flash. You're touching memory. You're touching sensor. You're touching sensor data. You're touching packets. You're touching actual things. And these are embedded type applications. And traditionally, we've put embedded CPUs in them to solve those problems. All right, so previous presentation talked about the need for determinism. That's one of the key characteristics that's needed for these embedded applications, because you want to process these things very quickly with specific real-time requirements. Because by their nature, these are embedded products touching the real world, which means you need to respond in real time. At the same time, all of these new areas of applications, these new areas of compute, are becoming more intelligent, and they require more intelligence. Right? People want to make these devices smarter. Right? We talk about uh, at, the, at the edge. People want to put in the sensors the ability to do the processing there. You want to put AI at the edge. That means you want to do processing on real data at the edge before sending it into the cloud. So we look at these broadly. I divided up. So the first in the consumer space, new type of consumer devices, uh, AR, VR, gaming devices, smart home, smart speakers. Uh, these are examples of applications that are uh, embedded applications but require intelligent capabilities. If we look at storage, networking, 5G, there's a lot of storage and networking companies that are part of the RISC-V Foundation. Why? Because in these compute areas, in these storage applications, in these network applications, everybody wants to offload the compute to their piece of it. 
So in your storage controller, can you put intelligence in your storage controller to do AI? In your network card, in your switch card, uh, in your fabric, can you do intelligent processing on the packets before they, they get passed through? Right? So everywhere along the way, people are do, putting compute because now we have the capability to, to put compute in these nodes. Right? Finally, machine learning edge. This is probably the biggest one that everybody talks about and it shows up. This kind of covers to me the world of IoT, which is basically sensors, things in the world with connectivity. Um, but we realize now we can't send all the data back, so we have to add intelligence to the edge. But still, you have to do what's needed at the edge, which is process the data. So that's where combining the real-time capabilities, embedded part comes in with the intelligence. So RISC-V has a huge opportunity here because from an ISA standpoint, it's the only ISA where you can have a single ISA for all of these applications. So if you look at Sci-Fi's products, the way we define our products, we have U cores, S cores, and E cores. The E and S cores are embedded cores. So these are kind of your traditional uh, embedded type applications, microcontroller real-time capabilities. But here in RISC-V, we have 32-bit embedded cores, which we call E cores. We have 64-bit embedded cores, we call S cores. So now you can expand to 64-bit type applications. And then you go to your U cores, this is your Linux type applications. You need to run your full-featured operating systems, virtual memory, MMU uh, type support. It's also supported here. And if we look at RISC-V, it's the same ISA for all of these, just with different privilege modes uh, and different features. Nowhere else do you get this, right? If you look at ARM, ARM has ARM v7, ARM v8, v7M, v8M, v 8 a, these are all different architectures. They're all called ARM, but they're different architectures for different applications. RISC-V is coming along at a time when we can have the same ISA for all these applications, which is gonna make the software much easier, which is gonna why the ecosystem is developing much faster. Right. So then if you look at the Sci-Fi IPs, besides the U, the S, and the EC uh, cores, we have different series. So this is getting into now our Sci-Fi implementations, right? So Sci-Fi implementations-wise, we have the two series. This is our smallest, uh, most power efficient, most area efficient type cores. So these are things like two to three stage pipelines used for small, you know, sensor hub type applications, you know, microcontroller type applications, um, efficient MCUs. Then moving up, we have the three and the five series. These are higher performance cores for applications and embedded. So here you start to get into things with caches, uh, with, with what we call TIMS, tightly integrated memories, or, or TCMs. Um, and here you get both 32-bit and 64-bit embedded variants plus the applications. And you can combine these. And we'll talk about some of this uh, heterogeneous and real-time capabilities uh, in the next few slides. And then the latest series, this was announced uh, in, in about Q3 last year, uh, is the 7 series. So the 7 series, it's high performance, dual issue in order pipelines. Again, there's 32-bit, 64-bit, and 64-bit uh, applications. So you with the same type of microarchitecture, we can cover different types of uh, series and applications. Uh, if you compare this to our previous generation, so it's about 60% increase in performance, 10% increase in speed. So it's quite a bit of speed up compared to what exists today. Some of the new features, this goes into when people say, well, why, why should I switch to RISC-V? And, and the easy answer and the easy trap that we get into is people just want to compare, well, what's the power, what's the performance, what's the area, right? But people have solutions today, and even though, you know, RISC-V goes in and, okay, you're 20% faster performance, you're in 50% less power, those are just, to me, nice to have. You know, it's, it's nice that it's faster, it's nice that it's smaller, but you really need to bring in capabilities that are going to enable people to do new things, to solve their problem. So if we look at the 7 Series, yes, we're very competitive on PPA, but some of the key features that we talk about that enable these applications that I talk about. So the first, this is a multi-core configuration. In here, in this gray box, you'll see both U cores and S cores. So this is the, one of the things that sci fi can do uh, as part of, thanks to the being the ICA being the same, is we can heterogeneously combine different types of cores. So now in a single coherent cluster, you can have application U cores and embedded S cores. So that means you can run Linux on your application U cores, run a, you know, some firmware on an S core, have another S core do some security monitoring or, or whatever other function that you may want, and then all of these cores are coherent with each other. They can see the same memory map, 
Um, it makes software programming very easy. Uh, if you don't have this, you have to have very complex mailbox schemes, uh, message passings, uh, et cetera, uh, in order to happen. Of course, RISC-V is extensible, so you can add your own instructions. This is really important as we get into deep different applications. Um, we talked about, the, we'll talk about the ter determinism. I think the earlier presentation right for me, uh, we talked a lot, you know, examples of why that's useful. So here, again, you can have different types of cores in your multi-core system. You can have some of your cores be configured to be very real-time and very deterministic, and then have some of your other cores uh, be pro uh, set up to be more performant. So you can really take the use case and apply it directly to, to what you need. Right? Um, more things on the, the deterministic and real-time constraints is cache lock capabilities, uh, being able to lock the L1 caches, uh, lock the L2 caches, designate parts of those as integrated memory uh, instead of as cache, uh, caches um, are all very important features. All right, so let me talk about a few of the specific markets um, and where these types of capabilities come in and why it's important. So storage uh, is the first example where the coherent uh, heterogeneous cluster is very valuable. So SSD controllers traditionally um, usually have real-time cores and they're running firmware applications uh, using that to run their uh, LDPC, error correction, uh, other things that they need in order to read the flash. As we make these devices more intelligent, they want to run intelligent stacks. So the easiest way to do that is actually have a Linux core on there, run Linux, and then you have the entire Linux software framework available. So now people can put different types of AI frameworks, different types of algorithms, different types of processing in their SSD controller on their application core while at the same time still having your real-time core capabilities to run what you normally need to do, so in a single controller. So that's a coherent in-cluster combination. Um, having configurable memory maps, being able to add different accelerators, and then being able to configure exactly what you want in the core. Um, so storage is a good example of this, where you do not need, in many storage use cases, uh, things like a floating point unit. Um, but if we look at what's available in the market today, if you want a application core or high performance core, those all come with floating point units, multimedia extensions. Um, so then you're getting more than what you actually need. Uh, so this goes back to RISC-V enabling people to get exactly what they want and Sci-Fi making it very easy to do so. In 5G networking, um, you need very fast responses. There's a lot of real-time requirements. There's a lot of determinism on this, um, being able to uh, have hard real-time capabilities in deterministic, you know, disabling the branch predictor, setting up the memories um, so that you can respond to things uh, in real time is very important uh, in this market. Right. Complex arithmetic, this gets into kind of some of the future things that are coming with RISC-V in the vector extensions, uh, in custom instructions, um, to do these like heavy-duty processing in the CPU environment where it's easy to program. All right, on the AR, VR side, this is a real new area. I think this problem is, is not gonna be solved anytime soon. We're gonna see multiple generations of products, each improving upon the others. Uh, but one of the key themes is the need to have lots of different accelerators to do lots of different specialized processing. Um, a lot of processing is still happening. So in here, we see a lot of applications where people are adding different types of accelerators to their cores. So being able to control your accelerators tightly coupled accelerators along with custom instructions is very important. Uh, one of the things here, when we say combine different types of series, the earlier example of the heterogeneous I showed was with a U7 and an S7, but you can actually combine any one of the Sci-5 core series with other core series inside. Um, so this allows uh, much more complex configurations, like lots of two series, for example, for, for small type of functions uh, or accelerator handling uh, along with the larger cores. Um, so we see this used uh, in these type of applications. All right. So I mentioned earlier that I think this year we're going to see a lot more products become public. Um, so the ones I can share uh, that are public, this is just really in the very, very beginning stages. Uh, there's lots of customers in the past year that's been working on products uh, that we expect to announce soon. Um, but in the last year, in these spaces, so wearable AI, so Huami, I think most people should be familiar with Huami. They build uh, wearables, smartwatches, fitness bands. In China, September, they announced this chip. It's the Huangsang Yihao, uh, the HS1. Um, in there is a Pi5 E31. 
Um, so this is a wearable product that's going to be shipping in product uh, this year. Fadu is an example of an SSD controller. Um, so this was announced at the Flash Memory Summit. Again, also was last year, I think, August. Um, so you know, these are all like recent announcements. Um, so this is an SSD controller uh, that they built. Uh, when they built this, they announced that they used three RISC-V cores from Sci-5. And in doing so, they achieved one-third the power, one-third the area of their competing solutions. All right, so that, that's what they said when they, when they announced it. Um, and then uh, on the edge or general purpose, uh, the micro semi, uh, microchip FPGA, um, just to be clear, these are hardened cores uh, inside FPGA, um, actually hardened uh, U54s and S51. So it's that combination of heterogeneous multi-core uh, in, in silicon. Embedded intelligence everywhere, what do you need to enable that? You need very efficient performance. You still need your cores to be very high quality. Right? We still need to make sure that um, they're com very competitive on power, performance, area. Um, but the fact that RISC-V is scalable from small to large across all of these applications, I believe is a huge advantage for all of us going forward. Um, and this is why any new markets who are looking at this is going to be looking at RISC-V. Because not only does it work today, but because as they can see their products go uh, into different spaces, they can continue that software investment in RISC-V. So having a scalable portfolio of cores to cover that is very important. Um, and then finally, a compelling feature set, right? So it's not just about the cores executing the instructions as defined by the ISA. There's things in the microarchitecture, there's other capabilities that we talked about today that are very important to customers for these applications. 